of like give you a sense of how we went into this. Our first product came when basically TensorFlow was released. We were like, oh, this is super cool, and etc. So we started, we actually sold this to a luxury watch reseller in London. And we showed them how cool you could recognize your Rolex watches and stuff like that. And uh, that was one of our early uses of uh, you know, visual AI. This was in early 2016. At the time, uh, we used a trained Inception V3 model, if I remember correctly. And that was pretty cool. It worked very well. And we even fitted it on a phone later on, initially with cloud, but later on a phone. So a 30 million or so parameter model, which is not a lot by today's standards. But it worked really well, 95% accuracy. It's like one out of 20 maybe is not gonna work very, very well. That was, uh, that was like, you know, wow, in 2016, of course, because things change. So you could do all this, get the data and start training the model with transfer learning in something like a day or two. But you could, if, you, if you're really in a hurry, you could go even faster and use uh, this cool technology called AutoML. How many people are familiar with AutoML? Okay, half the crowd, roughly. So, AutoML is a product that uh, came from uh, Google. Initially, it was research based on neural architecture search and uh, other variations with also genetic search. But basically, it's the idea that, hey, I have a data set. It's like, I took all those pictures of my Pringles and other consumer good products. What is a good model before that data? You know, maybe the generic model that's been trained for ImageNet, I can do transfer learning, but maybe I can have a better architecture, neural architecture. So effectively, Google does this for you. You just give it the photos, and it will come back and tell you, oh, this is your trained model. And this literally can happen in less than 24 hours. So think of this, not just from the technical point of view, but from a startup point of view. This is incredibly cool. You could have basically a visual AI product in one day. That's it. And later on, you know, if you don't want to depend on AutoML, you can build your own model with transfer learning, as we said. But in just one day, you could literally build a proof of concept and show it to a customer. This is how crazy the world we live in is. So I think this is really remarkable. So, but at the end of the day, this is all 2D data, you know, and can we do some stuff which is more exciting? So more exciting is 3D. And so, so far we looked at augmented data. It's like we took data, we turned it around, etc. I'm going to present now a real use case that we worked with a customer, uh, which was interested in recognizing fossil underground data. So imagine that you have 3D shapes, uh, micro fossils, uh, like those ones. And you need to recognize those in underground data for multiple uses, such as age dating, the environment, finding uh, particular properties of rocks, things like that. So could you do this in 3D? We're all familiar with 2D, but 3D is a much harder problem for multiple reasons. So this is an example of data that the customer gave us. It's a micro CT scan. So it's actually a cube of data. So these are not pixels, they are voxels, okay? So it creates complication because First, you know, it's much harder to find like a good 3D model, uh, you know, uh, available. But also there are many engineering problems around memory and such because this is quite dense. And you see like we're trying to recognize the very small fossils there. Is it a uh, foraminifera planisipiral or a FB serial, etc. But importantly, it's not just classifying them, it's also segmenting them. I want to look for their shape. So this is, you know, like a harder problem, much harder than the one before we, we do. And because if it was not hard enough, client said, you know what, I'm giving you one cube of data. You know, good luck. So like, like you have a 1600 uh, by 1600 by 1600 cube, and that's only one. Why? Because it is a super lengthy process to actually have that expert go through that cube of data and specifically like label which, uh, you know, fossil and rock and think about it and also like show the shape. So you would say, like, if AI could do this, this would really save a lot of time and a lot of money. And they said, can you do it? Okay, so I'll tell you what we did on this one. So this is a real use case. Now, this is something that we have done for a client in a commercial engagement. What we did is basically we said, okay, you want to recognize 3D shapes, you don't have data. So I'm going to create synthetic data. So what you see here on the left is we literally took, we created sh shapes ourselves like squares, triangles, cubes, anything you can imagine. And we put them randomly in cubes. And we started training our model to recognize those. 
So this is not just augmented data. Before, remember, we took a photo of Pringles and then we rotated it. That's, I took a real data and augmented it. Here, this, it's not real data. It's invented data, like synthetically, for this problem. And we did this around 50,000 cubes with something in the order of seven and a half different million different shapes. That was step number one. It got us some way. Problem is, the shapes were not realistic. So guess what? We also have some very gifted 3D uh, art designers. So we asked them to actually draw for us in 3D real micro fossils. So let's look at micro fossils, and that's the next step of the project on the right. We told them to actually draw shapes that really look like micro fossils. And that was the next iteration. And again, we did something in the order of 50,000 cubes. And of course, we augment them, we rotate them, etc. But this is like you are basically creating the synthetic data. And initially, we started tackling the problem, uh, let's say, layer by layer in 2D. And ultimately, uh, did it in full 3Ds. Like, I take a voxel of data, I take a cube, and I get back a cube with the exact segmentations and the like. And these are real results. And you can see that actually it worked pretty well. So on the very little data that client gave us, and they tested it later on other cubes, we were able to get a dice coefficient of 77%. What that means is that for every voxel, we are getting it correctly most of the time, almost 80% of the time, which is pretty good when you think that, hey, we had almost no data. So this is the way you can be creative depending on problem. If you're looking at, for example, 3D recognition, you could use also 3D like Unity. You could create environments in 3D to recognize, things like that. But this is to show you that you can actually uh, in, like, create synthetic data to crack real problems. So that was the case. But of course, we can go beyond. And one of the interesting applications of AI today is everything around gener generative adversarial networks, GAN models. And it gives you really incredible results, as most of you know. So for example, in you know, contemporary art, modern art, it's like, almost impossible now to win at the Turing test, like recognize if an art piece is real or not real. That's as well now. But if I ask you, out of these three faces, which one do you think is real out of the three? Who would you say? No one, okay, yes, <laughs> it is no one. And I asked the question many times, so probably you looked at my lectures before, but <laughs> it's good. It means that you're following me, I'm glad. <laughs> but the, the, the old dude, frankly, if there was no context, I bet that you would not have recognized, you know, because I wouldn't. And this is the, the famous website, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Check it out, it's really fascinating. And every time you're gonna refresh, it's gonna literally draw 500 random parameters, get them into the neural network, which is roughly 500 million parameters, and it's gonna get you high definition pixels. It's truly remarkable. You can even check it now on your phone. This person does not exist.com. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. Like, you know, you could be a machine learning practitioner for many years and still be surprised by what AI can do. At least I'm still surprised. I'm still marveled. So this looks all good, but is it really useful? So I'm gonna try to play this. I don't know, uh, it doesn't work. Okay, so why is this interesting? Because you can actually use this in real data. So I'm gonna tell you now about something which is really, really cool. And I think it's really like an area to follow. It's, it's like the fight or the clash of the titans, self-driving. Self-driving is probably one of the most difficult engineering and machine learning challenges today. There, I counted once, there's something like more than 100 serious companies and startups trying to crack the problem. And in particular, there are two companies which made, like took a huge, huge lead into this. And they are Tesla and Waymo. And in many ways, self-driving is going to be a fight between who wins between Tesla and Waymo. And what I want to show you here is these are actual users of you know, data in smart ways. So let's look in detail of the strategy of each one. And I highly encourage you after that to follow what's going to happen over the course of you know, the next few years, because it's really remarkable. So Waymo is the self-driving division of Google, by the way. So, and Tesla, you know, most of you know, is the leading electric car maker in the world. Uh, so, let's look at Tesla. 
Tesla had an AI-first strategy. Why am I talking about this? Because what does it mean to be AI-first? It means putting data at the heart of what you are doing. For example, yesterday Stuart was speaking of how iRobotics consider itself now as a data platform rather than a drone operator. It's the data that matters. So what Tesla did that nobody did in hindsight was even before they had any self-driving technology, fit the car with cameras everywhere, sensors everywhere, and record the data. And when you buy or lease a Tesla, actually you are, you're signing something that you're sending this data to Tesla. So effectively, every person that drives a Tesla is effectively providing free data to Tesla. And this is a huge asset because I've listed here on this graph, you have now something like half a million Tesla cars on the road collecting data every day. And importantly, this is real life data with all the problems and you know, information that's going on. Maybe some highway has roadworks. Well, if there are some Teslas passing by, Tesla will know about it almost uh, before anybody else. Things like that. So the thing is, you have half a million cars which are, have the data and are now equip equipped with self-driving. So for me, this is like the biggest distributed machine learning, fleet learning in the world. Because what happens is that when you drive the car, there are two things. Either you're driving it manually, like you're in command, or the car self-drives. But let's say you're driving manually, so it's like no big deal, right? Nothing happens. Actually, when you're driving manually, in shadow mode, the AI system does something like 100, 200 inferences per second, and it compares what you are doing with what it would have done if it was in command. And every time there is a big inconsistency, bam, that's a signal. So effectively, the half a million Tesla car owners are like hired freely by Tesla, they're all like AI teachers. So this is one of the biggest AI teaching sessions in the world and is going on every day on the world's roads. It's fascinating when you think about it. And of course, when autopilot drives, obviously this is direct self-driving car information. And every time, for example, it disconnects and takes, tells you to take back command, well, that's an important information and so on and so forth. So the interesting thing here is they have now one billion miles of autopilot driven uh, data. That is massive. That's the Tesla approach. Now let's look at the Waymo approach and they have also some cool things such as software update and they try to use vision only. They say like if drivers can drive a car visually, I don't need LiDAR, I don't need laser to, to do it, I, I can just learn, etc. It's a general approach, they do it on every road in the world. Waymo is a different approach. Waymo has the best AI technology in the world because they are a Google company. And Google is probably today, you know, the best AI technology company in the world. So the technology that Waymo has is second to none. For example, recently we learned that actually DeepMind uh, gave advanced training methods such as uh, PBT, population-based training, to Waymo to improve, you know, the inferencing, the car and the self-driving. Waymo has a lot less cars on the road. They have something like 600 cars or close to 1,000 now, only 8 million miles driven compared to 1 billion Tesla. However, they train in simulation. Remember the use case that we were talking about earlier with the 3D where we basically invented the data, you know, like synthetic data? That's what Waymo does and it does it at scale. 10 billion miles, you know, which is more than the miles driven by Tesla in the real life. So Tesla has 1 billion real miles driven Waymo has 10 billion, but synthetic data. So the interesting question is, who is more advanced? We don't know, because it's, it's almost like a philosophical question. Can you actually simulate the real world without learning it? We don't know who is more ahead, or is it just real miles? So Tesla is gonna tell you, oh, only real miles happen because I'm gonna see some crazy fancy scenarios. Okay, Google says, no, but actually, you know, you can only see so much in the real world. What about, if a fighter jet lands on a road, yeah? What do you do? Did you have that in your real data? You don't have it, it's an edge case. <laughs> By the way, this happened, I'm from southern Tunisia, like a, a city called Tatooine, like Tatooine from the sun planet in Star Wars. And guess what, three months later, earlier, I'm not kidding, a Libyan fighter jet landed on the road 10 miles from where I live. Like a, a guy just left Libya with a fighter jet and he just landed on the road. That's an edge case, I was like, 
I would be curious what self-driving would do on a case like this. <laughs> so this is why I'm talking about this, because you see that the challenge of data is central. There is no doubt that Google has the best AI in the world. Tesla has Andres Karpati, ex-OpenAI, ex-Stanford Vision, top guy also. Both are world-class teams. So it all comes to the data. Who is ahead? I don't know. And that will be very interesting to see who wins this race. But it's going to be likely one of these two. All the other players are way, way behind these two. So that's, that's kind of what's going on in terms of like challenges of data. But there are opportunities for you as a startup or potential startup founder to get into this data race. And this is a uh, data at the edge. So on device machine learning, have you been at a session about on device ML so far? At Indaba, how many people? Okay, yeah. a few people. So, AI at the edge is super important, and it's even more important for Africa. It's this concept that why is it interesting? Because, first, when you're inferencing at the edge, so your model is in the phone or it's in you know, the little chip where, which is linked to a camera or things like that, you don't have latency first. It's happening there. You don't have to send the data to the cloud and back. It works offline also, which is pretty cool. It's also less expensive because a lot of the cost is about shipping data back and forth. And sometimes maybe you're in a remote village and you don't have a good internet. There is no way you're gonna send like good quality images to the cloud. So it really makes sense. From a power efficiency also, it's cool. So actually uh, Google, and uh, I know there are some people from the Google team here, the Edge team uh, in this room, they actually made demos all this week, and if you go to the Google stand, probably they have it today as well, uh, with Edge TPUs. So Edge TPUs today, and this is really a game changer, you can have actually 200 frames per second inferencing. This is incredible. Like every second, you have run a visual AI model, probably in the order of maybe a billion or more, billion, 15 billion multiplication additions, and you've done that 200 times per second. It's really incredible. And you can get all this technology for $150. So this is a game changer. So why is it a game changer from an ecosystem perspective in Africa? It's because the technology is progressing and the cost of it is decreasing exponentially to the point where sensors are almost going to be for free and computing at the edge is almost going to be for free. So think about a farmer in a remote area. He can have advanced AI capture all his metrics, no need for cloud, no need even for electricity. You can actually run some of those devices, the, the lighter ones, for a year just on a battery. That is a game changer. And this is how, as Africans, we can actually catch up to the rest of the world. Because the whole world is full of data. It's all about capturing it and digitizing it. And now, for the first time in history, Africa has a chance to compete with the best. And by the way, this is not a distant dream. Let's look at what China did. So China had this online to offline revolution, O2O, where in sometimes like, you know, like WeChat, the WeChat app, you can call anything, you can uh, call for food, you can call for a car, you can order all sorts of services, you can do bike sharing, things like that. So, all those, especially with AI at the edge, all those are massive source of data. But you can interpret this data locally and only ship to home or to base the data that you care about. So there is a huge revolution going on there. Same thing, let's say, for brain and traffic planning. You know, sometimes in Nairobi, for example, there are problems with congestion. And there is something stupid, which is called the red light. Red light is stupid because, as you know, you know, you're standing at the red light sometimes and it's green on the other side and there is nobody. <laughs> so it doesn't take a PhD to know that if there was a, a, vi a visual AI component on the, on the red light, you see there is no one, so it tells you, okay, green, and it stays green until somebody comes. So Alibaba is actually doing this in China. It's called the City Brain Initiative. And they have measured improvements in traffic speed of up to 15, 20%. So this is very significant. So does it take geniuses to do this? No, any one of you could go ahead tomorrow in their community, in their city, start digitizing data, packaging it, and selling it as a useful service. Uh, so for example, in Tunisia at the moment, we're discussing with uh, some uh, you know, like, uh, road authorities 
to have a system to, for example, recognize and count the number of cars, things like that. In London, there is a congestion charge in the UK. If you get into London, it's just automatically visual AI. They get the license plate of every car. And uh, if you are, are entering in London and you're not paying congestion charge, they will fine you, things like that. But interestingly, so the use cases abound. And I think this is a great opportunity for anybody who wants to do a startup project in Africa. But interestingly, it's the speed at which all of this is happening. 20 years ago, China was not a player in machine learning and AI. Yet, by sheer willingness, sheer willpower, they now have something like, in food deliveries, 10 times the US. In bike ride sharing, they have 300 times more rides than the US. This is crazy. But that tells you something. That tells you it's about willpower. It's not about how developed or from where you come from. If you have the willpower and the intensity to tackle real-world challenges, you can actually implement truly disruptive products and services that are going to benefit your community. And so AI at the edge, for me, is the biggest opportunity in Africa. And it matches very well with another technology which is called decentralized data and federated learning. How many people have heard about federated learning? Okay, like 30% of the audience. So, federated learning is a concept on which uh, Google has been innovating this year and which is truly disruptive. What's the downside of putting visual cameras everywhere or recording your voice on your phone or tracking what you're doing? The potential downside, and can be a very serious one, is that you're really invading privacy. So, is there a way, is there a best of both worlds where I can train my machine learning to be, to be really efficient and really useful for society and for my company while I'm guaranteeing privacy. And that's possible. So how does it work? It's this idea that until now, we were shipping the data to the model. And the model was very often on the cloud. And we kept the data, of course. That's what most people did. Now the opportunity is I'm actually shipping the model to the data, not the other way, not the data to the model. Now I'm taking the model to the data on the device. So let's see what happens. You start with an initial model, you put it on device, and it's going to locally train because you know devices are so powerful and models are so light these days thanks to progress in neural architecture and such. It's going to train on the device. So it's going to slightly tweak the weight parameters such that now it's slightly better and fine-tuned to you. Okay. And now, I'm not sending back the data to the service, I'm sending the model to the server. And imagine that I'm doing this for many devices. And rather than, it's like saving, your exact model has been trained on your data that maybe you could back up what the initial data that you was used to train it is. I'm doing a sort of averaging, and I'm doing some cool mathematics to guarantee that I cannot reverse engineer this. So you have a breakthrough. Because now, effectively, you can learn on device and use that learning without the data ever leaving the user. So if the data is on the phone of the user, it stays on the phone of the user. And you can prove it. So I believe federated learning combined with AI at the edge is truly disruptive. Because you could do amazing things, for example, in healthcare. Obviously, health records are confidential, and this is something very serious. If you find ways to guarantee privacy but still learn, this could be a completely disruptive way to do healthcare in Africa or in the world. And this is a very exciting area, by the way. Uh, the winners have not emerged yet. There is a lot that could happen. So I highly encourage you to have a look at what's going on. So this is an example from uh, Google I.O. Uh, since I'm a Google machine learning dev expert, you know, they gently gave me the slides, so I'll show them to you. So this is about predicting the next word you type. Obviously, each, each one of us has a certain style. The model will uh, fine-tune to you, but the data is not really going to leave the, your, your phone. And of course, you know, the results are better. Uh, same thing with emoji prediction. Surprisingly, you can predict very well what people are going to do in emoji. So that's another example. Uh, I'll show you an example that we did, actually, during the Indaba. Our Lagos team, led by Teju, actually built a cool app called Seren, which is a networking app. The idea is like you, s you give your preferences about what kind of work you do in machine learning, your, your level of education, your centers of interest, etc. And it's going to recommend other people for you to meet. 
And all this happens in federated learning styles. So us in Stadip, we never see the data, but yet we can give you targeted recommendations about uh, go and meet that person and stuff. So we deployed it for the first time in, uh, in, uh, in during the Indaba. But the message is, this can be done. And it can be done at a relatively you know, cheap cost in terms of people, time spent, and, and budget. And so these are truly disruptive applications. So I hope this use case, we finished the use case about data. I hope what you get from it is the concept that, of course, data is central to machine learning. And it's better to have more data uh, than a super smart algorithm. And yeah, there are many ways on which you can create data. And obviously, like, data is central to all the fights we see in the world, and uh, there's huge industrial application. And interestingly for Africa and for all of you, we're at a point now where with AI at the edge becoming cheap, with uh, uh, like privacy guarantees from models such as distributed, uh, like federated learning, homomorphic encryption done by OpenMind and Andrew Trask and people like that, it's really a fantastic time. And there is so much to do. So just a few words about culture. Now we're back to startup and the life of a startup after we spoke about data. So just a few words about culture. We spoke yesterday about how it's very important to have momentum to keep a team going. But culture is also extremely important. You need, how to say this, you need to be good karma, I believe, to succeed in this business. Meaning that you really want to be fair to everyone, uh, have a massive diversity. Uh, I'm very proud, for example, that at InstaDeep, uh, out of the three person running the company at the executive committee level, two of them are women, uh, my co-founder Zora and our CFO Isabel. And I believe diversity is a strength, both in terms of male, female, but originality of backgrounds and not having only PhDs or not only graduates and mixing and matching. We, we love that at InstaDeep and we found that it favors outperformance, it favors positive emulation. And machine learning should be fun. So even if you're working on a product for a year, there should always be side projects that keep the team engaged, uh, fun stuff that we develop from time to time just for you know, the heck of it. This is, this is the spirit. And if you have that spirit and you have this mentality that you should be grateful and thankful for the position you have if you're doing an interesting machine learning startup and that you need to bring back to community. For example, at the Indava, we have a record 15 employees at InstaDeep who are here. Why? Because we think it's really important that they come, they meet amazing people from all over Africa, uh, give knowledge, uh, try to help. I'm very honored to be part of the steering committee for the first time this year. So you need to have that sense of mission and duty. Life is not just about trying to be successful in business. And in my experience, the most surprising thing is when you have those values built in, like it's a feature of your startup. For example, if you join a study one day, you will be helping the community. You're going to be running crazy hackathons, things like that. So what's, what's in it for in study? It doesn't matter because when you do good stuff, it's like karma. It will come back to you. And that is the spirit. So it's very important that for you who are the elite of Africa, you have this mentality that yes, you want to be successful and you're going to work very hard, but part of success is actually helping others. And that's the best investment you can make. And this is very important to have the right culture because culture binds people together and there is no company with great culture and great momentum that has a high turnover rate. It does not exist. Turnover is because people think it's boring, they don't like the value of the company or they think nothing is going on. But if you have those, you're in very good shape. So uh, now I'm going to uh, leave uh, Stuart tell us about traction and uh, a few cool things. And then we'll be back. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, so yesterday we kind of like introduced a few things in the first session. So basically, how do you evaluate the startup idea that you have? Um, and how do you go about like finding co-founders and like building a great team? And we also gave a case study on like aerobotics and the products that we've developed. And then um, we've given the case study on like InstaDeep and we have like a good idea of what they do. And Karim has introduced you guys to, you know, a whole survey of cool things that you can do with data. So 
I hope at least some of you have come up with some good startup ideas while you're sitting here, because the goal of this session is actually to inspire people in Africa to pursue um, careers in entrepreneurship and uh, not just do postdocs uh, wherever they go, right? <laughs> so the next step is really traction. So we've gotten to the point where we have an idea, we've quickly hacked together an MVP, uh, we've taken it to our customers, and now we need to actually go and build this into a business, right? So as far as like recommended resources go on traction, like don't read any books, it's a waste of time. Like maybe watch a few YouTube videos because they're nice and quick. But uh, the advice is really just to go and talk to your customers. Like if you have people that are paying for your very shit MVP that you've just developed and put into their hands, like you need to understand like who those people are, those are the early adopters, understand why they're using your product uh, and what isn't working for them. And this is kind of the advice that you would get given at like any startup accelerator. Like the, a good story of this is like the Airbnb guys at Y Combinator when they got in. We're in San Francisco, like, you know, at Y Combinator. They met up with um, Paul Graham, who was one of the co-founders of Y Combinator. And he asked the question, like, where are your users, right? And they said, well, we've only got like a few people that have signed up for this Airbnb thing, which back then was just like couch surfing on the internet or something. Um, and he said, uh, where are they? And they said, no, in New York. So he said, what the hell are you doing here? So then they jumped on a flight, they went to New York, uh, met up with all of those people and really like understood like what it is that, that they needed uh, to be successful. So when it comes to traction, like talk to your users. Another important thing is to understand that there are two types of traction. There's real traction and then there's fake traction, right? So it can be, um, you can measure things in such a way that it looks like you're making progress uh, when you're actually not. So you're kind of spinning in place. And these are what we call like vanity metrics. So a vanity metric is something that tends to go up even if um, you're kind of like none of the work that you're doing is actually making your product any better for people to use, right? So an example of that might be like the number of users with registered accounts. Like, That'll just tend to go up as people find the website and like sign up, right? But that doesn't mean that the work that you did last week has necessarily improved the likelihood of people signing up uh, for your product or improved the likelihood of them actually finding it. So a much better metric to be measuring there would be like month on month the growth of active users. And the key word there is active, right? Because people often sign up for websites and then they don't even get to the point where they register their emails. You know, they don't even like confirm that step. So have a good definition of like what active users are. And then another metric is like the total number of mobile app downloads. Like a lot of startups will report on this and it's a pretty meaningless metric. Like just because somebody downloaded your app doesn't mean they didn't uninstall it five minutes later because they realized it was crap, right? So like make sure that you're tracking like month on month growth of like app uh, downloads uh, with registered users who are actively using it. And then you also need to track things like the acquisition of those users. You need to track their retention and also your monthly gross uh, dollar churn. So how much money you've lost out by losing customers because your MVP is not very good. So these metrics will tend to like go up and down. They're quite stationary. We're a bunch of statisticians and mathematicians here, so I don't need to explain what a stationary time series is to most of you. But like you'll see something like that and you'll be able to measure like improvements over time as opposed to just looking at cumulative metrics. So I've just got like a list of some of the metrics that you should probably be measuring when you start your startup. So things like bookings versus revenues, that's an important one to, to be tracking. You should be tracking things like total versus recurring revenues. And this is actually a very important one because when you're going to an investor and you're saying, hey, I've got this MVP, I've got these early users that are somehow using this, this product that we've built. They're going to be asking you questions about how much of that revenue is actually recurring month on month or, or like week on week, right? Because that's much more predictable. It's much easier to predict what your revenues are going to be if you have a subscription model than if you have just a once off service that you're doing and then you're earning money for, right? So you tend to get higher valuation multiples if you have more recurring revenue than just once off revenues. Also, gross profit margins. So this really comes down to something called unit economics. Like, are you actually doing the work that you're doing profitably? And this is something 
I've got some slides on this just now, that, um, that startups tend to do quite badly, at least now at the hype of kind of like the startup bubble that we're in. Um, people think that it's okay to operate non-profitably. Um, okay. And then customer lifetime value is a good metric as well. So this will measure like what is the value of keeping this customer using your app uh, in perpetuity, right? So it's basically saying like what is your, like how long do you expect to have this customer for and then how much revenue do you expect to get from them? And then the next one is your customer acquisition costs. So these are all like really important metrics that as soon as you go to an investor and you say, hey, please invest in the startup, they're gonna be asking you for these things. So good advice is just to measure it from day one because you don't wanna like try and like compute what all of these things were back like when you, you, know, when you started. So get this right in the beginning. Uh, you also wanna track product metrics. So this is like slightly more interesting stuff uh, if you're not interested in the finances. But uh, this is actually how people are using your product. So like monthly active users, how many people are actively engaged with your apps, you know, with your software that you're developing uh, every month. The month on month growth of your customers. So like how many more customers are you getting every month and is the work that your startup doing actually contributing to increases in growth? Um, monthly gross dollar churn, so that's how much revenue you're losing out by people basically unsubscribing and stopping to use your app and then a customer acquisition pipeline. So basically just tracking all of the stages of going from finding out about your product on the website to downloading the app, to registering, to like setting up the payment details and just tracking what the fall off rates are because like, you know, if you, if you have a fall off rate of like 99%, you know, and you have, you know, 100 uh, people register, it means that you're only gonna get one person that actually generates revenue for the business. Another really important thing to understand is like what your go-to-market strategy is gonna be. So it's like, how are you going to actually get this into people's hands? And you get two types of these. So you get uh, very sales heavy and very marketing heavy kind of strategies for getting people to, to use your product that you've developed at your startup. And this really comes down to like, whether you know, it's a very expensive product, uh, whether it's a very complicated market, large market, the complexity of the market that you're selling into, uh, the product market fit that you have, um, your customers, whether they're more sophisticated or less sophisticated. So generally, the more complex and more expensive a product, the more high touch the sales are gonna be. So you're gonna have to have a sales force at your company that's going out uh, meeting with customers, building relationships, and like closing deals over a very long period of time. Uh, whereas if you have like an app that anybody can download and use like from day one, um, it's more of a marketing-driven exercise. It's really just saying, uh, how can we get people to know about this product like as, as much as possible? Okay, cool. So this is probably my favorite slide. It's just lies that startups tell. So the first one is um, that Startups are following this Amazon strategy. I don't know if you've ever met up with a company that said that they're following an Amazon strategy. So they seem to think that like losing money every month is a strategy for like building a successful startup. And you know, you look at like Amazon and you look at Uber and you look at Lyft and you look at um, uh, WeWork and these companies are kind of doing that as well. Um, but it's not quite as simple as just, oh, you can lose money and somehow turn that into a great company. Like ultimately, if you're losing money, you're losing money, right? And, uh, and if you need to keep raising funding uh, to keep your business alive, your customer isn't your customer, it's the venture capital firms that you're kind of stringing along to put money into your business, right? So what Amazon did very successfully was that they had very profitable unit economics, which means that every single thing that they did generated profits for their business and they had an extremely aggressive investment strategy. So they would take all of that money and basically reinvest it into their business, into new products. Also, Amazon only raised uh, venture capital funding once. Um, so that kind of like proves that, you know, they weren't um, like these companies that only survive month to month or quarter to quarter or year to year because they're able to raise more and more funding. So, we spoke a little bit about product market fit yesterday. Um, and I think it's good to like, and also it came up in the panel a lot, like Ulrich and Otto and Karim, everybody was like saying this word product market fit. So what is product market fit? And this is probably the best definition. 
uh, from Mark Andreessen. Uh, it says that customers are buying the product just as fast as you can make it, or usage is growing just as fast as you can add more servers. Money from customers is piling up in your company checking account. You're hiring sales and customer support staff as fast as you can. So the most important part there is the part in blue, right? So money from customers is piling up in your checking account, which means that you can actually afford to like invest in a sales force to actually go and like, you know, um, take your product to market more. So if you don't have good unit economics, so every single bit that you do, every work that you do, you're actually losing money, um, then going and raising funds and like doing it quicker just means that you're gonna die faster, right, as a startup, basically. Another lie that um, startups sometimes tell is that, and this is actually a joke from, from 2001, like at the height of the internet bubble, we lose a little money on every customer uh, but we make it up on volume. Like, that's not possible, you know? Uh, like, don't think that just, you know, as soon as you hit one million users, all of a sudden your unit economics are not gonna be shit, right? If they're shit, they're shit. Um, so you need to kind of like make sure that your pricing is good and that you're making money on, on everything that you do. So Karim's gonna be talking about ecosystem next. Um, but basically the slide is just saying like, get help where you can. So Aerobotics was fortunate enough to be like uh, part of the Google Developers Launchpad. They're also part of like a startup accelerator before that. Uh, but there are, another, there are other easier ways that you can get good advice from mentors. The startup school from Y Combinator is probably the, the best thing that anybody who's interested in starting a startup should go through. And you can see all of those videos on YouTube. Cool, so now we're talking about ecosystem. Okay, so, sorry for you know, the infrastructure problems. But yeah, ecosystem, as Stuart was mentioning, is super important. So first, I completely agree with uh, the YC Startup School. I think it's the best uh, free resource that you can find today if you're interested in building a startup. And it really teaches you so much. There is also the option of applying to YC, which I think is super important, because the simple fact of applying to YC is going to teach you a lot. Like they kind of have those ways to kind of force you into being super uh, brief and super clear. And if you're not clear in your head, well, you'll notice at that point. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, we applied to YC, we actually made it to the final round without a good product. But the experience in itself was fantastic, and those people are probably the best in the world. Now, the good news is they are not the only ones, and there has, I believe, never been so much money chasing African entrepreneurs. So money is not the problem anymore in Africa. It's about quality. If you really come up with a great motivation, product, team, like we discussed, and you're building a great culture, etc., Actually, the money is available. There are many funds, like Savannah Fund, for example, is available, is based here in Nairobi. Uh, there, is, there are others, uh, one of them, for example, Africa Invest also is a large fund. It's a lead investor at, uh, at InstaDeep. So today, the excuse that, hey, I cannot do a project in Africa because I cannot find the funding is just flat not true. The funding is there. If you cannot find it, it probably means that you haven't refined your project enough. But lots of lots of funds are available, and this is new, and this is a great opportunity for Africa. But it's not just funding, because you also have amazing accelerators. So I'm a machine learning mentor at Google Launchpad Accelerator Africa, and I'm really impressed by the level and quality of the startups that come from all across the continent. But interestingly, I'm also impressed that, frankly, Google is doing this for free. Like, Google is bringing in, like, many of its teams, it's inviting people, it's organizing everything. Sometimes it even, even gives money for free. They give free equity grants, means, like, zero equities. Like, they just give you cash or compute on TensorFlow, on, uh, on, uh, on Google Cloud CPUs. So, this is incredible. And this is an incredible opportunity for all of you. And uh, with other tech giants scaling up in the continent, such as Microsoft, for example, and others, I believe this is really an incredible time to be focusing and thinking about launching a startup. Because you have the advice, 
you have the credibility enhancers. For example, if you apply and you're accepted at Google Launchpad Africa, hey, you're part of a Google program. And maybe you can then qualify to a global program like uh, iRobotics, like Stuart said, they, were, you know, they made Launchpad in San Francisco. So those are massive credibility enhancers. If your company is using machine learning and somehow has been vetted by the best AI company in the world, Google, that probably is a good start when you're going to start pitching uh, customers about, about your product. And there is uh, BizSpark from Microsoft and others. So those are incredible opportunities. And it's not just, uh, you know, like structures. It's also about people. There are many people who are doing incredible things for the ecosystem. I'd say, uh, you know, among the very best is Shakir, who really has spent so much energy to organize the INDABA this year and previous years together with the steering committee. It's my first year as a steering committee member and quite frankly, I've been really impressed by the level of dedication, uh, teamwork to get such a complex and intense event taking place in over a week, plus all the national INDABA X you know, events going. It's truly remarkable. And everybody is contributing his free time and energy to do this. So this is an opportunity. So make it count. Not, don't just come here and learn some stuff and say, hey, this is all very nice. Make it count. Do something out of it. Try to, how to say, try to go the extra mile. Maybe there is an incredible mentor that you could meet during the Indava. Because frankly, like, you know, this is something I said last year. This is like no rips, but just for you, you know. It's probably easier to talk to top AI scientists here, like, like Dave Silver last year or Richard Socher this year. It's probably easier to talk to them here than to, be, to talk to them at NeurIPS because NeurIPS is super big and they're, they're too busy. They won't have time for you. So these are opportunities. I'll share one example of how you can leverage this. Uh, back in 2015, uh, 2016, that period, when we were starting to really scale up our machine learning products, Sam Altman, the uh, then president of Y Combinator, and now he's leading OpenAI, he came to London, he did an event like this. So there were questions. I actually asked him a question. I said, Sam, would you drop everything now to focus on doing a machine learning startup? And he said, yes. And actually, that advice influenced me. We went all in machine learning and AI, and I never regretted it. So you can really pick up the, the brains of people who are fantastic, the best in the world, on specific problem. So rather than when there's question time, no, don't ask any question or ask just a question to, for the sake of asking a question. Ask a question you really care about. Ask a question that could influence your decision making. That's the way to leverage that. And even better, go talk to them. Uh, find a way. If you have already a startup product, find a way to say, hey, why don't we do something together? Let's give me a chance. Let's see what happens. Those people are here to help. And incredibly, this can take you a big, big way. So people like Anyedi, for example, who's leading, uh, leading the uh, Google ecosystem in sub-Saharan Africa, is doing incredible work to help startup founders. Same thing with Fola, who is running a Launchpad Accelerator, and, and many others like Sunson, also the head of MLGDE. So you are lucky to have all those super talented world-class people at your disposal, so make it count. Don't be shy. Actually, they're there to help. If you have an opportunity you want to talk about, never be shy. Go ahead and, and do it, because it's important. And it can lead to fantastic things, like tech, par tech partnerships. Uh, part of what we believe at InstaDeep is that a, a part of the solution in Africa is to develop your own product, innovate, but also leverage the most you can the goodwill of the superpowers of the tech world. As I said, companies like Google and Microsoft, they actually have budgets to help startup founders. This is how you can make Africa actually a strength. You know, this is an example of us meeting with uh, Mustafa Sisse and Jeff Dean last year. We actually spent, uh, we were privileged to spend 45 minutes with Jeff Dean. How many startups in the world can have that opportunity? Not many. But hey, he was at Indidaba and we took the chance. So what I'm saying is you can transform compared to, let's say, a startup which is sitting in Silicon Valley or in Europe or in Asia. You can leverage the fact that you are in Africa into a strength because, uh, you know, many of those tech giants and tech leaders, 
some of them really want to contribute. Some of them feel that Africa needs to, you know, get its rightful and place, uh, you know, among, you know, the rising, uh, you know, ecosystems of the world. So these opportunities become possible. And you can leverage those. And one of the ways, for example, from our own, you know, uh, experience, well, last year, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, we met with uh, Nando de Freitas. And he liked us, he challenged us, we took the challenge. It ended up in a joint paper publication with DeepMind. That is for NAI SATA quite a credibility marker. But it happened because we engaged with him. And when we saw the opportunity that we could do something with him, we went all in, you know. It's not like he said, okay, I'm gonna do it no matter what. He kind of hinted at, hey, there is this problem. Maybe you should look at it, that's it. Well, we spent five months on it, like working like crazy until we cracked it or began, began to crack it. And then we came back to him and he liked it and it made a collaboration. So be proactive, you know, that's, that's a big lesson of how uh, you can get, get there. And as I said, those tech partnerships, this is us with Nando last year, actually. We were like looking at some AI research. It's really like, it can get you so much. Mentoring, access to computing resources, uh, straight cash in case of some accelerator without even equity dilution, uh, access to of funding to AI research. For example, how many of you know that uh, all the tech giants actually provide grants for research? For example, imagine your startup is working with a university. Imagine you're out of a university, you have good friends there. You could actually collaborate on a research project your startup cares about and the university cares about and have all the money paid by Google or Microsoft. Isn't that cool? Well, this exists. I actually, frankly, I didn't know it existed. I realized this time speaking to uh, a few people from those tech companies that this is possible. So be curious. The opportunities are much bigger and much more available than you think. But you have to go be curious, ask and dig. And we're all learning. I discovered this this year, which is, hey, this is cool. We're going to do it for sure. And I hope many of you will do as well. You know, like have paid research with cool universities on a project that you care about. Who wouldn't take a deal like this, you know? So that, that, these things exist and joint research, as, as we mentioned. So we're going to get back to uh, fundraising and exiting. And I'll be back for concluding uh, words. But I think Stuart has very good advice about how to raise funds and ultimately sell your company. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so I mean the, the previous section on like traction was probably not all that interesting, but it's, uh, it's really what unlocks like this section, which is fundraising, right? So this is what you see all day long in the news kind of coming up, oh, this startup has raised this much money and, uh, and at this crazy valuation. And most of the time people are looking at that and saying like, how on earth could that startup that does like, I don't know, some like face filter be worth that, right? Um, so we're gonna be talking a little bit about like the industry, like how venture capital actually works, how they see companies. And, uh, and the reason why we included the, the traction section was because if you don't measure that stuff, then they're just gonna not even have a meeting with you. So you, you gotta, gotta get those in place first. So I think the first thing to understand is like, what exactly is the venture capital industry, right? Like, how does it work? Like, we know about these, these, um, these startups that are raising these crazy sums of money, but who are they getting this money from? Like, how does it work? What are the expectations that come with it, right? So first off, like, the most important thing is that fundraising is not an accomplishment. Um, like, the fact that your startup had to go and raise funding, which most startups do, uh, just generally comes with more expectations, more dilution of the equity and the cap table, and uh, it, makes, it makes it almost like there is more pressure on your business to succeed. Um, so raising funds is not necessarily the best way to do it. Like some of the best companies in the world raise one round with like the best VC on you know, Sand Hill Road, just as like a signal to say, hey, look, we're amazing. And then they don't raise money ever again. So WhatsApp, for example, did that just to kind of like show that you know, they could attract like the best VCs because it's a good signaling mechanism to the market that you're a serious player, right? But basically how the VC industry works is that you have entrepreneurs, so people in this room, who have great ideas for businesses, right? What we do is we come up with the MVPs, we, you know, start getting that initial traction, we find users, you know, your mom, your dad, your uncles, like at first, and then eventually, hopefully, 
you know, more than just your immediate family, to actually use that app and you start building traction, you start generating revenues. And then inevitably, what you need to do is you need to raise funds so that you can grow your business, so that you can scale, you can go into different parts of the world. So Instadeep closed their um, Series A with, I think, $7 million worth of funding. Uh, we closed our Series A at Aerobotics with $5.5 million worth of funding. And currently, we're right in the middle of like a Series B uh, fundraising process, which is surprisingly a lot of work. Like, um, you'd be surprised. Anyway, but how that works is that venture capitalists are actually funds. So they're kind of like hedge funds in a way. So what they do is they have like high net worth individuals, institutional investors, endowment funds from universities that give them money, right, to invest in startups. Um, but ultimately, they need that money for something else. So if it's an endowment fund, so let's say we're talking about Yale or Harvard University's endowment funds that are giving money to a venture capital firm. Ultimately, they need a return on that money so that they can use it to fund projects at the universities. The general period that they would like that return on investment on is kind of within 10 years of giving it. So most venture capital firms will set up a fund to invest in startups with a given a theme, so maybe it's an ag tech fund or it's a fintech fund or something like that. It might be limited to a specific jurisdiction, so uh, you know, North American like companies that are in fintech or it could be like emerging market funds. So there are actually a lot of emerging market funds in the US that will explicitly look for companies in Africa and, uh, and in developing parts of the world to actually invest in because they see more potential for returns in our markets than in developed markets. And then venture capitalists ultimately work with investment bankers to actually go and return, um, to take that startup that they've invested in and actually generate a return on investment. So understand it like this. So you have your startup, you've got an idea, you need money to, to basically scale that business up and to do more, right? So you go to a VC fund, but the VC fund has gotten that money from like Yale University and their endowment fund, right? And they need that money back in cash at some point in the future. So it puts a lot of pressure on businesses to actually exit at some point. So an exit is generally an acquisition by a large company. So most of the acquisitions these days, at least in, in the startup space, seem to be happening with like large tech companies um, or listing on the stock exchange, which is when you basically become a publicly listed company and the investors that invested get you know, their return on investment and they can give it to their investors who've put money into the funds. So that's basically like how the industry works. It's good to understand like who the investors are, why they're actually investing, and also what that means for your business. And I think the most important thing is to understand what it means for your startup. What it means is that you will have to, at some point, make a return on investment for your investor, right? Or die, right? Like those are kind of like the two options. So. Um, how the VC industry works is that either they want your company to be a billion dollar company um, or they kind of want it to just, you know, you know, cease to exist at some point. But there's no real like middle ground option where you become a profitable business and somehow you pay back your investment with dividends because that takes a lot longer. So really there's, it's kind of like steroids, like you're injecting like steroids into your business and you need to grow and scale like after you take VC funds. So another thing that you need to understand is that when you approach investors, so generally you'll approach a whole bunch of them, you'll approach like between 40 and 80, you know, different uh, venture capital firms, and you'll say, we want to raise a series A, this is the value of our company according to whatever model that you're using. If they're interested, they'll tell you that they, they'll express that they're interested and ultimately you need to find like a lead investor. So like a big investor who's going to take the majority of the equity that you're going to raise. So you're going to sell off a chunk of your business in order to get cash so that you can grow the business, right? Um, so generally how that works is you have a lead investor who will take the majority of that equity and they'll actually get follow on investors to kind of like fill up the rest of the round. And when you know that an investor is kind of getting interested, they'll send you something called a term sheet. So I don't know if anybody here has watched like Silicon Valley, the TV show. Yeah, okay, there are a few of you. Okay, so you'll get a term sheet, right? And like what most people focus on and even that show focuses on almost entirely is the valuation. It's like, what is this company worth, right? Um, 
And the crazy thing is that actually what matters almost more than the valuation, at least materially when you're selling your company or when you're IPOing, is the terms and conditions that are in that term sheet, right? Uh, so there are a number of things that you need to understand if you want to raise money for your startup that if you don't understand will potentially come back um, to haunt you uh, when you're trying to sell your company. So first of all is liquidation preferences. So liquidation is basically when you take this company that's developed some you know, technology and some product and you have some users and you, you basically exit. So you're turning like this, um, this private you know, wealth which you can't trade into something which is actual like money that you can put in the bank or you can return to your investors, right? Liquidation preferences is basically all of the terms and conditions regarding who gets their investment back first, right? Um, and it's really important to understand because um, some liquidation preferences will actually have multiples on them. So let's say you have a company with two investors, and this might get a little bit technical, right? But let's say you have a company with two investors, like a Series A investor and a Series B investor. And your Series A investor has a two times liquidation uh, preference, um, and your Series B also has like a, a two time liquidation preference. Both of them invested like $5 million from the Series A, and you got $20 million from the Series B. Let's say down the line, you sell your company for $100 million. So it looks like things have gone spectacularly well. If you take the equity out um, for the Series A investor and the Series B investor, there's still a lot left for, for the founders, right? But what a liquidation preference means is that they get first dibs and they get to choose either their equity uh, value of that company, so their percentage of that 100 million, or they can take two times what they invested, right? So maybe it turns out that you sell your company for less than, than uh, what is ideal and you sell it for $60 million. Your first investor has invested uh, $5 million. They have a two-time liquidation preference, so they can actually just take $10 million out of that straight away. Your second investor invested $10 million. They also have a two-time liquidation preference, so they can take out $20, $20 million straight away out of that. So you've already like, almost like lost $25 million of that you know, $50 or $60 million valuation. And sometimes there's actually situations where because of liquidation preferences, there's no money left uh, for the founders and for the employees. Like that's kind of like the worst case scenario is when you sell your company for significantly lower than the, rent, than the rounds that you raised before. So basically I'm just saying that like you need to understand this because there are ways in which you can actually sell your company for a lot of money and get nothing out. Um, that does happen, okay. Um, and if that didn't scare you, then I explained it very badly, I'm sorry. Um, Anti-dilution rights is also something really important. An anti-dilution right basically gives an investor um, a guarantee that their shares won't be diluted if you have a bad round. So let's say, and then, you know, a whole bunch of you said that you have seen the Silicon Valley TV series. There's a scene where somebody talks about the down round and how that destroyed their company, right? It's important to understand like what that what that means. So let's say you raise like a round at like $50 million and then you raise the next round at like $30 million. Um, an anti-dilution right for an investor will basically say that they, nah, they're not, they didn't actually make their initial investment at $50 million. They made it at $30 million and then they just get more equity in the business that is valued less. So you as the founders and you as the employees have your shares uh, diluted and the investor maintains their kind of like um, equity stake that they took in the business. It's also important to understand that there are different share classes. So when somebody is investing, they're buying shares in your business. Uh, so they're taking an ownership stake and they can do that in different ways. You can get common shares, you can get preference shares, and it's important to understand what the voting rights are on those different shares. And basically everything else in the term sheet you need to understand in absolute detail. Um, because there are many ways that you can get fucked and you basically just need to know like how this, how this all works. Then the next question is like, all right, so let's say you need to raise money because you wanna grow this business. Uh, so you've decided to take the plunge and do that. So like how much should you raise? Ultimately what you wanna do is you wanna raise enough money so that you can get to profitability. So you've got unit profitability, every single bit of work that you do, you're making money on and you're doing it at scale and you're growing. Uh, in that situation, you can pretty much you know, charge whatever you want ultimately when you choose to exit your company because you are default alive. So you can just, you're an ongoing concern as a business. There's like 
If you just continue to operate exactly as you are now, you wouldn't run out of money. So what you want to do is raise enough money that you can get to that point. Okay? But the probability of success is almost never in your, fa in your favor in startups. And this is not to dissuade you guys, um, although like the probabilities are, are pretty bad. But basically, like over here is we have a table. So they did a study in, so it's US based, it's not, it's not uh, the whole world, uh, on what the probability of you basically being able to raise your following round. So going from like a series A to a series B to a series C, given the fact that you raised your previous round. And also, what is the probability of you successfully exiting your company? So actually selling it to another company and turning it into cash that can be returned to your investors and to their investors, right? And pretty much the probabilities of you succeeding uh, never go above 30%. Um, they're always below 30%, and they're especially low uh, in the earliest stages of the company. So if you look at this table, you can see that um, if you have raised a seed round, the probability of you not raising a series A, which is the next round, is 80%, right? Which means even if you get seed investing, there's an 80% chance that you're not gonna make it to the next round. But furthermore, there's a 97% chance that your business will not exit at any point in the future, which means you won't be acquired and you won't IPO. You'll just die, right? So there's a 97% chance of failure given that you've raised a seed investment. So even if you've got a first investor to give you money, odds are still pretty bad, right? Generally, the odds of success get slightly better as you go along, but they don't ever get much better than 30% you know, chance of success. So what that means is that you can't get complacent. Just because you've raised a Series A or a Series B at a fantastic valuation and you're flush with cash, doesn't mean that your business is gonna survive. And this is a mistake that a lot of startups make, is that they get this money in, they think that they've made it, get a nice fancy office, hire a lot of people, you know, and then you know, you've got like all the perks, you've got like free lunches, and they're coming around with trolleys and giving you chocolates and stuff, and then ultimately you die, right? Like that's, uh, that's the most likely outcome, and it's important just never to forget that, because it'll make sure that you do things, um, you allocate capital like reasonably. So I think Karim said it best, Basically, there are a lot of African venture capital funds. So the excuse that, oh, there's no funds in South Africa um, or in Africa that I can raise money from is, is no longer true. Um, he has just a few which I picked out. So these are actually some of the investors that have invested in Aerobotics and into InstaDeep as well. There are tons of them. And uh, there is more and more and more money flowing into, into the continent to actually fund great startup ideas. And if you're here at the Deep Learning and Dalbed, it means that you're already you know, in the top percent of you know, people in your countries. You know about deep learning. You know about what can be done with these technologies. So there are people out there who can help you grow your businesses. But it's very important that you get the right investors um, because you're going to be working with them for a very, very long time. And you want to make sure that you have a good relationship from them. But also, you should see them as a way, almost as a mentor, right? So once you've raised money from an investor, they have a vested interest in your business succeeding. They don't want you to fail. They actually want you to be ludicrously successful, right? So then when you're raising your next round, what you should be doing is saying to your previous investors, hey, please help me. I need to raise more money for my business, you know? Um, so, you know, make sure that you're getting a good mentoring relationship and getting a lot of good advice from the investors that you take on. This is a picture of the co-founders of Aerobotics signing their first investment with 40i Capital, which is um, one of our first investors. So now I'm going to be talking a little bit about scaling. So once you've kind of like um, raised your funds, the next step is to really start scaling your business. So the first thing to do is control your burn. So your burn rate is basically the amount of money that you're um, spending every single month. And it's mostly going to salaries if you're doing a tech business. Your run rate is the amount of time that you have left to live before you run out of money. So your run rate generally after a big um, Series A or Series B or Series C is between 18 and um, 18 and 24 months. So generally, people raise about a year and a half to two years worth of capital uh, based on their projections and how much they think that they're gonna be spending in the future. It's very important to make sure that you allocate the capital that you've raised to the right projects. Uh, so there's a good like formula um, from like one of the guys at Y Combinator on like how to do that, and that's basically just saying that 
um, the priority of a project or the likelihood of you, you know, the, the weight that you should give it in your capital allocation is equal to B times B, B times D over C. I mean, the, the formulas in VC don't get very complicated. Um, and B is just the number of customers which would be affected by what you're investing in. Uh, D is the average importance to that customer and C is the cost. So basically what you're doing is you're making sure that you're investing in the stuff that's gonna have the biggest impact for the most people at the lowest cost. Because uh, that's most likely to kind of give you a good unit profitability. The next thing is to not hire too quickly. Startups do this all the time. They go on a hiring spree straight after raising um, VC funds. And, um, and like more often than not, like this is, I think this is probably the single largest like source of failure for, for startups is that they hire too many people, they have too many uh, bills to pay and then they run into cash flow positions, like cash flow issues down the line. So there's uh, like a tweet um, thread Twitter thread from Paul Graham, which was like particularly interesting on this topic, basically just saying that like the number of like Y Combinator startups that have gone through, so I think they founded like a few thousand startups in the last like um, 10 years. The number which have been killed by like spending their money too quickly um, is just like enormous. Like most of them just spend their money too quickly on the wrong stuff and that's how they die, right? The number of startups that really spent their money slowly and then you know, hired intelligently, invested their capital wisely, those ones tend to be the ones that make it. So just because you've got you know, um, you know, 15 million or 20 million dollars in the bank doesn't mean that you have to spend it. You know? Make sure that you're doing things as slowly as possible. Cool, so the next thing that you need to consider, and like Karim spoke about this as well in the culture section, is like what is the effect on the culture of your business of scaling? So regardless of, um, like ultimately you will hire people to help you scale, like that's like probably gonna happen. But as soon as you start hiring people into a business, um, people tend to get a little bit territorial, right? So. There's a great article that was written on, on First Round, uh, which is like probably one of the best like blogs on like startups and businesses that you guys can read. Basically just saying that the number one advice that somebody, she actually worked at Google and she grew some of their teams from like 15 people to hundreds and hundreds of people, is that you need to give away your Legos. So she likens building a startup to building like this amazing, cool like Lego structure uh, and when you start, it's just a couple of you with like this big box of Lego and you're just kind of building stuff, right? And then all of a sudden, like there are other kids that are coming in, you know, to this and they also want to like play with the Lego. Uh, and the initial reaction of people is just to kind of like hold on to their Legos. They don't want to share, like, you know, go away, go find your own Legos. Um, and that's like contributes to the culture. So as soon as you, you have this, you get very territorial, feelings get hurt, your star players leave because they're asking questions like, you know, is this person taking my job? You know, are they gonna be better at it than I am? Um, they're asking questions like, what does it mean for me in the long run? Does the company value me at all? Um, and these are the questions that people are gonna have, right? So what's really important as like a founder of a startup and as like in the management team, is really just to make sure that you normalize these feelings and you tell people like this is how you're gonna feel. Like we're gonna go from 30 people to 200 people in the next you know, five years if things are working. And uh, you're gonna feel like stuff is being taken away from you. But the reality is that that box of Lego is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like raising more capital and getting more people in the business means that you can do more stuff. You can build more complex Lego structures, right? So give away your Legos and then turn around and find another pile of Legos to play with and build something else like really cool. Uh, so it's really important just to manage the culture like as you're scaling. Um, a lot of companies die because of this as well. Cool, so let's say you are very successful. You, so basically what that means is you came up with an idea, you evaluated it, it's in a good market. Uh, you go and develop an MVP, you get initial traction, you attract some initial investors, you start hiring, you scale, and now you've got like a really profitable business that's kind of running. Now there are two general ways that companies exit, right? And you have to exit because ultimately you have to give the money back to your investors, preferably with like five or 10 times the amount that they gave you, right? Um, 
One is through acquisitions, and the other one is through IPOs, initial public offerings. So acquisitions are basically when your company is acquired by another company. And most of the tech acquisitions that have been happening, or like startup acquisitions, have been happening by very, very big tech companies. Google is buying companies left, right, and center. Amazon is doing the same. Microsoft, all of these large companies are buying startups everywhere, all the time. And there are three very important things to consider when you ultimately get to this point. And neither InstaDeep nor Aerobotics has gotten to this point. So most of this is just theoretical from my side. But one is like timing and runway. So how much time do you have uh, before your company is going to die? So if you are an unsuccessful company, so you haven't got to the point where your unit profitability, your defaults are live, right? Um, and you're trying to get acquired because you don't think that you're going to be able to raise another uh, another round and you know the value proposition is maybe makes more sense as part of another tech company right um, then you need to take into consideration like how much runway you have left because these negotiations can take an extremely long time so you want to basically do it uh, with at least a year's worth of runway so that you can go into the negotiations with enough time to come up with a decent valuation for your shareholders uh, but also for your employees and yourself if you're a successful company, you don't have to worry about that because your default life, you have an infinite amount of time to negotiate, which means you're going to come up with a fantastic deal. The next thing that you need to consider is the valuation model. So how are you going like, to like, define like, what this company is actually worth, right? If you're a very mature startup, so you've really matured a lot, you went through a lot of, of rounds and you've got unit profitability and you're growing, then maybe like your traditional valuation models like discounted cash flows, which look at you know, your cash flow is coming in and out of your business and projecting that into the future. Maybe that will work, right? Um, but more often than not, you're going to use one of three models. So one is a revenue multiplier model. So you look at your monthly recurring revenues, you multiply it by 12, and then you multiply it by another factor, which takes into concern, consideration how much growth this company thinks is still left for your business, right? And that's generally how you get these valuations. So if you're doing like a million dollars in monthly revenue, Multiply by 12, you're doing $12 million worth of revenue a year, um, and then you multiply it by, say, um, 10, because they think that you know, that's going to grow by a factor of 10 times in the future, and you get to a valuation of $120 million. So that's pretty much how like, startup valuation is done, kind of back of the napkin type stuff, right? Um, another way is to look at listed companies. So are there companies on the stock exchange which are doing similar stuff to you? Like, what are they priced at? And they'll use that as like a benchmark. And then the third one is there's actually derivatives pricing models that have been developed specifically for pricing startups, but that's super complicated and it's not worth going into. And then the next thing is cultural fit, right? So I mentioned uh, in the first session yesterday something called founder vesting. So when you take money from an investor, they're generally going to make you as a founder sign a vesting agreement saying that you're going to work for your own company to get your shares back. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, but when you get acquired, Often they're acquiring the people in the company, they're acquiring the assets, the technologies that you've developed. So they don't want to acquire you and then you just leave, right? So make sure that the cultural fit is good because you're probably going to spend like a number of years there after you've been acquired um, because you're going to be vesting that, uh, those shares that you sold. So that's what we call golden handcuffs. And then initial public offerings. So this is... Uh, basically, where you say, all right, this private company, which has done you know, really well, we're going to actually list this on the stock exchange. So it becomes a publicly listed company. Anybody can buy and sell shares in that. And how that works is you approach an investment bank, which will basically run the whole process and take a fee. And they will, um, you will end up selling like some percentage of the privately owned shares onto the market, and then people will be able to trade them. Um, IPOs recently have been declining, so there are less and less IPOs that are happening every year. And um, some of the more recent IPOs, like Uber, have been quite interesting because they've been a very unprofitable company. So the IPO landscape is very different. It's been changing a lot. Um, I don't think we have too many like, very good success stories yet from the continent of like, massive IPOs. So maybe somebody in this room will be doing that 15 years from now. Cool. So then just like a few closing notes um, for some of the people who went in the session yesterday. Um, 
pick a problem that you actually care about. Because if you start a startup and it doesn't die, this is a long journey. You're gonna be doing this for 10, 15, 20 years, right? So if you're picking a problem just because it makes sense economically um, and you have no passion for it, as soon as the going gets tough, you're just gonna like drop the ball on that. Um, pick investors, co-founders, and employees carefully. Again, this is a long-term journey. You know, you wanna make sure that the investors that you're getting on board that are funding your business are people that you are, are like-minded to you, that you share the same values with. Your co-founders as well. So Karim spoke a lot about this yesterday, about like how to find like a good co-founder and who to build businesses with. Employees as well, like it's a lot harder to get rid of an employee than hire them. So make sure that you hire slowly and you hire intelligently. Uh, don't get distracted by business theater. Focus on customers and products. So I don't know if anybody here has done like information security. There's this idea there called security theater, which is that if you make stuff look hard to hack into, then people won't try. Um, so I kind of like stole that idea for business theater, which is like a lot of times like CEOs and founders, they'll get uh, caught up in the limelight. So they'll be in the press, they'll be doing interviews, they'll be hiring, they'll be meeting with investors for coffee. They'll basically be doing everything but making their business profitable and scalable, right? So try not to do that. Um, and then, sorry, you're not Steve Jobs. Like, Steve Jobs was a unique individual in the sense that he could, you know, go into like hiding uh, with like a product and have no market engagement, super secretive, build a product, launch it, and everybody just loves it, right? That is very rare. Um, most people can't do that. So launch a shitty product and iterate on it until it's not shitty. Like, that's the way that you should do it, okay? Uh, don't get complacent, like better companies than yours have failed in the past. Like if you look at the list of companies that have failed and like their startup ideas and like how much traction they had and how much revenues they were generating, it's scary, man. This space is super scary to go into, but if this is what you're passionate about, that's not gonna, that's not gonna scare you from like not going into it. But the important thing is just not to get complacent because um, yeah, like I said, better companies than yours have failed. Be transparent with your employees. Um, I think that's really important because like in good times and in bad times, they'll know that they can trust you and they'll know that what you're telling them is actually the truth. Great cultures don't just happen organically, you need to proactively shape them. So culture is something that is, um, and this is a quote from Benji, because so he's our CTO and co-founder. I asked him like if he would add anything and he just said culture doesn't scale, it morphs. Um, which is basically just that, like as you're hiring more people into your business, like your culture is the only thing in your business that does not scale. When you're a company with five people and you're a company with 10 people and you're a company with 50 people and 100 people, it's a completely different company. It feels different. The way that people interact with each other is different. So a large part of the job of co-founders is just to manage that culture make sure that there's transparency, make sure that people are giving away their Legos and actually sharing and like, you know, um, aligned with the success of the business. Um, and that's probably the hardest part, yeah. And that's kind of like the end of all my slides and Karim's gonna talk about AI in Africa now. Okay, so remember when we were saying yesterday, you know, startups, you have to see it as a life and death struggle. I think uh, Stuart Numbers gave some quantitative highlight to that. And frankly, this is why we're doing this also, because you have to see every advice that we give you here as slightly increasing the odds of you succeeding. Same way as a company that's going to be through YC is much more likely to succeed than a random company. Like the numbers we've seen are like aggregates or girls, all the companies in the US. For example, you are an elite group of machine learning experts or soon to be experts. This increases the odds. But this is why it's so important to take, a, as Stuart rightly said, a project where you're really passionate about. Because in the end, it's the passion that's going to make the difference. It's also all the mistakes you've done before that you, know, you learn from. So this is why, for example, VCs love to have founders that already had a project before, whether successful or whether failed, that they went through this before, they probably learned a lot. But I'll tell you in, to my sense what I love the most about the startup environment. 
is the fact that there is no hype. When you know the outcome is so clear, it's like super victory or total defeat. It's really you know it's it's a lot less, for example, political than if you're working at a large company. Like at large company, I worked at large companies before. You could have people who are really like doing nothing, just politics, and kind of like being a parasite to the work of others. And you can see these people doing very well for many years. You know. Why? Because the company is so big that you know you can have like suboptimal pockets that go completely unnoticed, and that's unfortunately how most companies in the world work. In startup, the beauty of it, and I found this very refreshing when I started, you know, looking and being in startups, you're actually like you're gonna see there is no hype when an employee comes or when a project starts. After three, five months, six months, you're gonna see the result immediately. So it's directly observable, and that makes it a lot exciting because. It's very tough, but when it works, it really works. And so there's a lot of excitement, and you are facing maybe sometimes for the first time in your life the real world, and the real world with all its brutality and excitement. And somehow it makes you a lot more experienced very quickly. I think I've learned more in five, six years in startup world than in 13 years in big companies. Like. You actually see the way things are, and importantly, that's how you can contribute. And every time you forget, you follow one of the advices that we gave you, you're getting better and more likely to succeed. But importantly, do something that you care about and that people, you know, do something people want and do something people care about is critical for success. So that's my advice. By the way, I wanted also to get back to a point which I think is very interesting when you're dealing with VCs, which hopefully you will do, is. You saw at seed stage, you know, 97% failure rate. So why would VCs invest money in a stuff like this? Can somebody tell me why? Like 97% likely to fail. What's going on? No, no, no. If it fails, they're not taking back their money. There is no money left. <laughs> yes. Yes, the upside is exponential. And this is, I'm insisting on this point because this is very important, okay? So say, for the sake of example, 97% failure rate. And these are aggregate numbers. These are not necessarily elite starters or etc. But 97%. So VC is going to make money on 3%. Imagine they invested in 100 companies. Only three of them succeeded. But imagine the success is venture-style return, at least 100x or more, okay? That 3% becomes 300%. And then suddenly, VC, it doesn't matter that most companies died because, hey, he's making money. He invested 100, he gets back 300. And especially at early stage, for people who were lucky enough to be in, at Uber, for example, I know one of these people, yeah. I think he invested something like $20,000 at Uber, first round. You know what? He's retired now. <laughs> so, there's part of it is luck, part of it is skill, but what I'm saying is the key message here is VCs only care about the return of the portfolio. So this is extremely important, and this points to what I mentioned, is it's extremely important to pick up, you have to choose your VCs in an ideal scenario where you're doing well, you have the chance to choose. Don't pick up VCs for whom it's only a financial gain and they really don't care about your mission, your project or your business. Because if you do that, they're going to be out on your back and putting pressure. You know, pressure increases after you raise money, but negative pressure. Pick up VCs who have a long-term interest into what you're trying to do. So long-term interest could come from two ways. Either the product that you're building is of direct value to them. This could be like a, a, like a, a large company that has a VC arm and that is fundamentally interested in what you're doing. That's number one. Or number two, they care about what you're doing from an ecosystem point of view, from a development point of view. And what it changes is still a financial investor, but what it changes is that there is a long journey together ahead. We're not going to be at the first difficulty fighting about numbers. This is very important. One of the reasons, for example, we chose to uh, have Africa Invest, and we're very privileged to have Africa Invest as our lead investor, because we shared a common sense that, hey, this is the time for Africa. They are vested into the ecosystem. They can also help us operationally in the many countries where they are. But importantly, they care about the journey. 
So there is immediately more long-term view than, hey, this is a random VC, he puts the money, and he's just sending, he's telling you, like, okay, every month, like, send me an email about how much money you made. And, you know, other, other than that, I'm not talking to you. You see what I mean? This is very important, and this is where you realize VCs do not play the same game as you, and it's very easy, as Stuart mentioned, that you get in situations where your interests are really not aligned and you want to avoid that from the beginning. So that's, that's an important point. So uh, coming back to uh, the next points, hopefully, yeah. So AI in Africa. Initially, I was not going to put these slides, but given how important it is, um, um, I thought I would still add them before we conclude this session, is as we all know, you know, AI is driven by three things, data, compute, like hardware compute, and better algorithms. All those are growing exponentially. So it's a triple exponential, you know about Moore's law, and uh, we had a cool poster about you know, quantum machine learning, so it's not like gonna stop just because, for example, silicon is reaching its limits. Uh, the number of research papers is following a Moore's law as well. So there has never been in history so many people focused on AI and AI research. So the message here is these three components of AI are all of them growing exponentially. So this is big. So that says that, hey, you should really look into machine learning and AI because it's not going to stop. But importantly, and uh, hopefully we have enough battery to finish, uh, importantly, uh, it's not just that. AI itself is accelerating these three exponentials. We showed you earlier how you can use AI to generate uh, synthetic data. And you can use that for, let's say, self-driving cars like NVIDIA and Waymo do that. You can now use AI for chip design, which is a remarkably interesting area. Not just, you know, chips for AI jobs, but AI designing chips. For example, Google does that and uh, others are looking into it. You can also have AI design machine learning models. This is neural architecture search. So it's accelerating. And this is very important. And this is maybe the key point. We as Africans cannot afford to watch the train pass by. Because if you look at development models in the past, look at China. China started by selling cheap labor to work in electronics components and things like that and factories. But now China is a tech power and China is becoming an AI superpower as well. So they went from a ladder of development of low skilled jobs into like the top. And this was historically the same model that Singapore used, that uh, Vietnam these days is using, and Cambodia, etc. The problem is, it's not going to hold in the future. So if you look at Africa, a lot of the revenues we generate as countries come from selling you know, commodities, oil and gas, you know, diamonds, gold, whatever, and also selling cheap labor. Unfortunately, these two will die out in the age of AI. Because when you will have robotic systems cheaper, doing the job cheaper than an employee or going and grasping fruit in the field better than an employee, well, that's going to have a huge consequence. And it's the same thing with smart energy. We are already moving, as we discussed earlier, from you know, uh, gas-powered cars to electric cars. The demand on oil and gas at some point might you know, start to decline. So, we cannot afford complacency. It's not a situation where, hey, AI is an option for Africa. Actually, I believe AI machine learning is existential. And this is happening much faster than previous revolutions. So it's either two things. Either collectively we jump into this uh, opportunity and make it count for our communities or we don't. It is actually one of the reasons why I co-founded Aid Study, because I believe that if people like ourselves don't do it, then it's a massive opportunity which is lost for everyone and we cannot afford to miss this one. It is literally the last ladder on which we can count to develop our countries. We just can't afford to miss this one. However, the good side of things is it's also the best opportunity ever because thanks to all what we've discussed today, thanks to funding available, technology available, tech partnerships available, anything you want to think about available, you can actually go ahead and do it. But it's very important you do it. So if you're hesitating between doing something else or launching a project, employing people and bringing value to the ecosystem, trust me, it's a no-brainer. It's the right thing to do and 
you're, you know, in a good scenario, not only will you be happy to be successful, but you'll be also proud and you will have helped your community. So for me, there is no more important task to work on. Like, even if this was not a job, I would do it for free because it's so important and at the same time, it's so fun, so interesting and you get to meet a lot of people. So to summarize, I mean, there is no doubt that the AI revolution is happening, but it's accelerating. It's literally an accelerating triple exponential and we cannot afford not to be part of it. And all the steps to launch a machine learning startup have never been easier than today. You could literally get started tomorrow and get good results. It's you who makes the difference. Like either you are focused, you try to avoid stupid mistakes and we've listed so many stupid mistakes here. Leverage the benefit of and the experience of others, leverage the ecosystem and you can get going and get to good results or you just say, yeah, I don't know. And then you'll see that the rest of the world will have bypassed us by an exponential amount because the difference between the people who are part of this revolution and those who don't is going to grow exponentially. Wait, watch out for China. They're doing incredible things and they're moving super fast. The US is already an AI superpower. The risk is that those technologies, which are extremely powerful, remain in the hands of a few. And it's our duty to bring that opportunity to our communities and to all the people we care about. So with those words, we wanted to thank you and uh, maybe uh, take questions uh, from the audience or discuss anything you'd like. Thanks a lot. Yes, question? Yeah, <laughs> please do. The first one was around uh, the advice around pick a problem you care about. I noticed it wasn't pick a product you care about. Also, so my question really is: Will it be proper for me to, for example, care about ML for agriculture and the formatting to begin to see how best we can add value in that space? Or should I be very clear, have an issue as an upfront that I'm applying ML to cassava? How do I go about it? Then, I, then to tie that to you, I know instant deep, for example, you do several things. You're serving literally everybody. So was your problem ML for problems? And what was your so what was what was the problem you picked? Was it ML itself? Or was it the solutions you would provide? Question number one. Two. <laughs> what is your take on products and, and a service startup? So I know instantly you service businesses. And so add, add, what do you recommend? Should, I, should one be a service startup or a product startup? And then the question, trying to that will now be B2B, B2C. How do you survive over the period? Then one more and I'll keep quiet. <laughs> So I look at this simple traffic lights example. Yeah. Frankly, it's no, it's no brainer to make a traffic light smart with all the... So ML. why don't we do it then? So now, that's where I'm going to, with all the ML on the edge. But the truth is, many of our nations are government driven. There's a lot of government participation. So if, for example, I do something around traffic lights, I want to go and engage the government, and there's a lot in that space. So how, did, how, how, how should we create products that are focused on the government or should we focus on B2B and B2C? Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's great questions. And by the way, Stuart, you're welcome to uh, answer, answer also some questions from the audience. But I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer those. First, you said you care about machine learning and agriculture. That's great. If you care about this field, you're going to be in the field, you're going to be looking at different problems and by doing that and observing and confronting your experience in machine learning with the observation of the direct problems and what people want, it's highly likely that at some point you're going to think about the product. And then you can apply the product roadmap pretty much like Stuart did. I mean, he showed us a photo yesterday. He was right there on the tree, you know, listening to farmers and how they want to calculate yield. So just go and try to understand what the problems are and because you are equipped as part of deep learning in DABA with AI superpowers, like literally AI superpowers, 
you can think about this specific problem and find the solution. And today, more than ever, there are multiple solutions available. You know, most of the things we discussed about in machine learning and AI, most people don't know about this. You are the vanguard here. I would say less than 1% of the population of our countries know, knows all what's been discussed here. Maybe not even 0.1%. So it's an opportunity. That means that there are many problems that haven't been solved. Okay, so that's one. On the government, I agree with you. We are in government heavy, heavy-handed uh, countries. And this is a point we discussed yesterday. Uh, you are not here, but feel free to, to check the session. The key point is design your startup so that you don't depend on heavy regulation or heavy interaction with the government. Not that government would not help, sometimes they do, sometimes not. It's just that they go slow. And as a startup in a life and death struggle, you cannot afford complacency. You cannot afford to do something in six months if it could have been done in one month. That is very important. Finally, the question about our own journey, and it's a very good question about you know, how we started as machine learning and what are we doing and are we planning product or not. I'd say, you know, pick up problems that you really care about and see where it gets you and keep learning. So I'll tell you from our own journey, I was passionate about machine learning in Africa. What initially get me started in this project was this crazy concept back then in Tunisia in 2014, 2015, that we could do AI at a super competitive level. So that doesn't sound a lot like a product, but by hiring and developing a great team, you know, I'll tell you this way, if we had started with a product back then, with our knowledge base, on our capability, it would have been a very, very, like crappy but like hopeless product. Maybe some visual AI and then later on Google would have come with AutoML and you're dead, okay? <laughs> so the, the path we chose was to maximize quality of the team, maximize experimentation. So how many of you know multi-arm bandit, for example? Okay, so it's like we play the multi-arm bandit game. Like we try this, we try that, we this stuff. And I'll tell you what we zoomed in in the end. And actually we're working on products and we will be announcing that, you know, at some point in the next uh, five, six weeks. We focused on deep reinforcement learning applied to combinatorial optimization and do well, solving problems in logistics, supply chain, with a full scalable, full product. That's what we are working on now. And the cool thing is, this is a hard product. Like, the number of people competing in this is relatively small. It's much better than what we could have ever imagined a year or two. So, this is to say that we're trying to give you advice, but every journey, ultimately, is the one you create. Are you going to hit all those metrics, all those advice perfectly? Hell no. Nobody does. So you, you just have to figure out a path that you can survive along the way and a path that plays to you, your, your unique strengths. What were my unique strengths when I started InstaDeep? I had some good base in applied mathematics and I also had a good knowledge about what's in Africa and what's in the developed world. I grew up in Tunisia, I studied in Europe, I studied in the US, worked in Europe, in the US, so I had a good sense of relative value. And so I could be the interface, if you want. So this idea that, hey, machine learning startup, starting from Tunisia, expanding to Africa, compete with anyone, that's kind of like in my skill set, especially that also I have the machine learning technique. So look deeply at your strength, your relative strength, these will guide you towards the problems you should care about. Because your strengths are also very likely to be where your passions lie. And you need passion to survive. Because inevitably, and Stuart was saying this, there's going to come a point where things are going to be very difficult. Like, I don't know any startup founder or any startup that smooth sale, series A, series B, series C, IPO, all good. It does not exist. The path is crazy difficult. What gets you going is just the passion you have for what you're doing and the great uh, friendship and camaraderie that you have with the, your employees and the sense that you're doing something important. So it's important, so we're not going to stop because there's a problem. Yeah? We keep going. So I think all of you have to figure out what there is something you're the best in the world at. You just need to figure it out and go look for how you can, with those skills, solve real problems and ideally problems that are not easy for others to solve. And if you think about it, that's the optimal allocation of resources for society. So this is useful for everyone.
started. I think startups is the most exciting thing you could do. It's also the most useful for society. And also incredibly, even when it's super difficult, etc., you're going to find some magic people along the way. And, uh, you know, like some events are going to happen. You're like, how did the hell this happen? It just happened. Why? Because you were doing interesting things. You were at the right place at the right time and you were moving fast and suddenly you met amazing people. So even from a human point of view, it's an incredible journey and you'll learn a lot more in two, three years. Even if the project fails, you'll learn a lot. I've learned from failed projects before and I think we wouldn't have gotten so far where we are now if we didn't fail projects before. And so you learn a lot, it's like compressed time, and especially when you're young, you have skills, the opportunity cost is very low. Like, what could you do in two, three years? Work in a large company? Yeah, you could do that. But guess what? If you're doing really something interesting in startup, and even if it fails, actually there will be employers that's gonna value that, and you could still do the corporate world later. So you are at an age where the relative cost of doing a startup is relatively low. Actually, I wish I was your age sometimes because I, you know, things are harder for me now than they would have been if I was like 25, fresh from university and wanting to take over the world. So you are in a unique position to tackle those things. Just learn the advice of others and never believe that you know it all because it's not true and nobody knows it all, neither me nor Stuart nor anyone. But if you leverage the experience of others and keep seeking their knowledge, you will be in a good position to do uh, interesting things. Cool. Thanks a lot. Yes. I'm moving to the standing of the official.